Um, so thank you for having me, everyone. So I'm calling in from Australia. Um, I'm in Hobart, so it's the evening here. So if it starts to get quite dark whilst I'm speaking, that's why. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about some work that I did with my colleagues, uh, Steve Rintoul, he's based at the CSIRO in Australia, Matt England, who's based at the University of New South Wales, and Melissa Bowen, who's based at the University of Auckland. And during this project, we wanted to try and understand what the causes of Antarctic bottom water, that's a deep water mass um, that is formed around Antarctica. So what the causes of uh, recent changes in that bo bottom water are, and also look to the consequences of what those changes. Um, and we wanted to come at this from an observational point of view and specifically try and estimate the transport, so the strength of that circulation of the bottom water, which is something that's uh, traditionally quite difficult to do uh, because we have very little observations in the Southern Ocean and especially in the deepest parts of, of the ocean. Um, so we wanted to come at this question from an observational point of view. Um, and so to, to answer that question, we developed this new method, which is what I'll um, talk about today. And so um, we developed this new method, we did our study and um, we published this paper, which is this title up here, um, where to spoil it, we found that there was um, recent uh, reduced circulation strength. That's what I mean by abyssal overturning here and a reduction in uh, how the transport of oxygen of that water mass uh, is into the Australian Antarctic basin. And I've got this little subheading here, which is Antarctic alarm bells. Um, and that's because the pace at which we found this uh, reduction was quite surprising um, compared to a recently uh, published ocean model. And I can talk a little bit about that later. Um, so thanks to all of my colleagues who uh, uh, worked on this with me. And also thank you to all of the scientists who have collected data over the last 30 years. We really took a lot of data from lots of different um, uh, data sets and cruises. Uh, so, you know, it's really a community effort here. So starting off with a bit of motivation. So water that's formed around Antarctica uh, goes on to fill the global ocean. So Antarctic bottom water, which is uh, what I've mentioned, ends up filling about 40% of the total volume. So here is a map um, which is showing Antarctic bottom water fraction below 4,000 meters. So these dark blue colors here mean that everything below 4,000 meters is Antarctic bottom water. So it's formed around Antarctica. So around Antarctica, we've got these darkest blue colors. And because it's uh, very dense, it uh, fills the deepest parts of the ocean and it slowly creeps northwards. And that's what we see with these darker blues here, sorry, these lighter blues here and these greens and yellows. As we slowly, uh, as we're seeing the slow sort of creep northwards of Antarctic bottom water. Um, so it's an important water mass uh, because of its size and its distribution, its global distribution. And it's um, formed in really only four fairly small regions around Antarctica. So despite going on to fill such a large space of the ocean, and here I'm uh, showing four different maps and they are focusing on different regions around Antarctica. So here we've got the Weddell Sea, um, here we've got Prids Bay, uh, uh, offshore of the Adelie Land and the Ross Sea. And in each of these four locations, you get a distinct uh, variety of Antarctic bottom water being formed. And the colors in each of these maps is um, just kind of highlighting where those waters go on to flow um, after they fall off the continental shelf and descend into the deep ocean. So we've got this um, large water mass being formed in only four locations and uh, its transport away from those sites is important for a few different reasons. And my talk is uh, focused on these two reasons. And the first one is that um, as it's uh, transported northwards, Antarctic bottom water drives what we call the lower uh, component of the global overturning circulation. And so the global overturning circulation is really a north-south exchange of uh, water masses. 
Um, and so what happens, uh, it, this is summarized in the schematic. So in the south, we get our very dense, cold water mass being formed. And because it's dense, it sinks down to the bottom of the ocean and it slowly creeps northwards. This then interacts with other water masses that are flowing around the ocean and it connects in this great big system. So you imagine if you start to get changes in what's happening here or further here, then that could start to affect uh, the global overturning circulation. And that's kind of a, a longer term um, uh, impact or consequence, if you like. But on shorter scales, um, Antarctic bottom water ventilates the deep ocean. So what I mean by this is that it provides oxygen to the deepest parts of the ocean. So the deepest parts of the ocean, uh, if Antarctic bottom water wasn't flowing through, it would be quite oxygen poor. But Antarctic bottom water has high oxygen values, oxygen concentrations. And so it delivers that oxygen down to the deepest parts of the ocean. So um, with the schematic, hopefully you can see that if we start to get changes in what's happening here, that's going to then start to have um, consequences further downstream and, and with these two important processes here. And so we are seeing changes. So between the 1980s and the 2000s, uh, Antarctic bottom water has been freshening and it's been contracting, so it's been shrinking. Um, and here I am showing a map from uh, work by Sarah Perky and others. And so the color, the shading there is showing the thickness of that water mass layer. But the important bit is the numbers in red here. And this is a thinning rate in meters per decade. Um, and to first order, the thinning rate's about 100 meters per decade. So we see this freshening and we see this contraction. We're also seeing basin-wide abyssal oxygen losses. So here I'm showing a map um, where we've got Antarctica down the bottom here. But these red colors are indicating uh, losses in oxygen concentration of about one to five uh, micromoles per kilogram per decade. So these darkest reds are five, five micromoles per kilogram per decade. Um, so we're seeing basin-wide abyssal oxygen losses, but the actual oxygen concentration of Antarctic bottom water at the source is unchanged. So we've got two conflicting pieces of information here. It seems that some of the properties are changing, but some of them aren't. But we're, at the same time, we're seeing effects downstream. So this kind of um, leads to a few gaps in our knowledge, uh, gaps in our understanding. And that's what we're trying to address with this uh, project. So I've summarized three gaps in our understanding. And towards the end, we'll go back to these. And, and hopefully, I will have convinced you that we managed to um, fill in some of these gaps. So the first one is, what are the physical mechanisms driving changes in Antarctic bottom water? So it could either be that there's a decrease in the production rate, so how um, fast that water mass is formed around Antarctica, or it could be a change in the source water properties with little production rate changes. So if you get changes in, say, the salinity at the source, then you would see freshening downstream. These are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, but there are these are two options. Second question, do the same physical mechanisms apply around Antarctica? And the third question, are the observed trends in Antarctic bottom water natural or anthropogenic? So to answer these questions, we looked to the well-ventilated and the well-observed Australian Antarctic basin. Um, and we looked at this basin because it's well ventilated, as I said, and by that I mean that it's fed by three different bottom waters. So three of those varieties of bottom waters, which I mentioned earlier on. So here we've got the Australian Antarctic Basin. And coming into this basin, as shown by these red arrows, is Ross Sea bottom water, Delhi Land bottom water. And we've got a small exchange of bottom water going on at the Princess Elizabeth Trough here. So we've got some of the, those bottom waters coming out and a different variety of bottom water coming in. These all combine to create a flow of Antarctic bottom water around the basin. Luckily for us, uh, in this basin, these bottom waters are generally uh, flowing through bathymetric gateways. So here, um, this Adelie Land bottom water is flowing just north of the Hakuri Seamount. And in the, the Rossi bottom water is generally constrained to flow along some pathways here. And we've got this small exchange uh, location here. 
And each of those gateways has been decayedly monitored with repeat hydrographic sections. So repeat hydrographic sections are um, latitude, in this case, latitude death uh, sections that uh, tell us about ocean properties. So it tells us about the ocean properties. And because we know the ocean properties, we also know the thickness of that Antarctic bottom water layer at each of these cross sections. So if we look at that data now, in this figure, I'm showing these latitude depth sections of absolute salinity, where the darker blues here are fresher waters and the oranges are more salty waters. So generally, uh, as we increase with depth, we uh, get saltier waters, uh, sorry, fresher waters. And each of these panels is showing um, a different location. So as we move here, we're moving eastwards across the basin. So here we've got this uh, gateway, which is measuring Ross Sea bottom water. And here we've got a gateway measuring Adelie Land bottom water. And here we've got that exchange at the Princess Elizabeth Trough. And as we move down the plot, we've got the change with time. So it's a little bit of, of a complicated plot. Um, but overall, we can see that there's a general freshening of these water masses. Now I'm going to show the same plot, um, but for neutral density. And what we can see overall is that we've got a general lightning. So we're moving to um, sort of a paler orange colors in these deep water masses. Apart from here, Rossi bottom water, we'll speak about that later in a second. Um, and now we've got our oxygen. So this is oxygen concentration, where these darker purples indicate the higher oxygen uh, concentration. So our Antarctic bottom water has a lot of oxygen in it. And um, although it is difficult to see on these shaders plots, I can tell you that the oxygen concentration is not changing above the error in this measurement. Um, so it's not changing above about three micromoles uh, per kilogram. So we're seeing changes in salinity, changes in density, but no real change in oxygen. Um, and what we found is that as the bottom water is freshening, the heaviest densest classes are lost because as you uh, get fre freshening of the uh, bottom waters, the, the densest part of that water just cannot form anymore. It just does not exist anymore. And the thinning rate that we estimated was about 115 meters per decade, which is similar to what um, Sarah Perky and others have estimated previously. And this bottom water area is related to variability in the density, specifically salinity. So as we get a decrease in salinity, uh, we're getting a decrease in the area of the bottom water across those sections. So we've seen the changes in, in the area, but these gateways also have well-placed moorings. Um, so these moorings are indicated by these stars here. And moorings provide um, time series of speed and properties. So we've, from our repeat hydrographic cross sections, we know what the property of Antarctic bottom water is, and we know what its thickness is, so its area. But it would be very useful if we could also know what speed that water was flowing across each of those sections. And that's what the mooring gives us. So here we are looking at uh, plots from the moorings where we've got bottom speed on the y-axis and bottom density on the x-axis. And if we start here, oops, um, what we can see is that as our density increases, our speed also increases. So this is the mooring at 170 east, which is measuring Ross Sea bottom water. So as our density is increasing, our speed is increasing. And that's because in this location, the flow of Antarctic bottom water is behaving similar to a density driven current. So it's not really surprising that we're seeing that. We've got a similar relationship uh, with the Adelie Land bottom water at 140 east. We've got a slight increase in speed as density increases. But that relationship is not observed at 84 East. That's the Princess Elizabeth Trough. Because these bottom waters are far away from their source, so they're not behaving like a density-driven current anymore. So we can see this relationship between density and speed. And as well as that, we can also see a relationship with time. So these points are colored by the season. Um, so for example, these green points, uh, which are uh, March, April, May have slightly higher speeds than say the blue points on average. Um, 
So we've got a relationship with time and we've also got a relationship with location. So for example, the Princess Elizabeth Trough, the speeds are much lower than in the other locations. So if we put all this information together, we can see that the bottom water speed and also the shear, which I'm not showing here, depends on the location, season and density. So we've got quite a bit of information in these moorings that we can that we can take advantage of. Now, the moorings give us information at one location about the speed, but what we really want to know is the speed across this whole section. So what we did to fill in those data gaps is we used uh, model output and we um, made uh, what we called structure functions. And that's summarized in this schematic here. So here we have our latitude depth section. We've got a blob of Antarctic bottom water that's flowing into the page. We've got our mooring that's positioned somewhere in that blob and is measuring speed. And then we've also, these dotted lines are showing where that repeat hydrographic section has measured this blob and that's giving us our properties, um, our properties and the thickness. If we take this speed measured at the mooring and we calculate a structure function, the structure function is simply relating, uh, it looks at how speed varies across the blob uh, on average and then you can times the speed that you get in your mooring by this structure function to recover the speed across this whole um, uh, cross section of Antarctic bottom water. And then you end up with this equation here, which is basically saying uh, speed times your area um, gives you a volume transport. So that's what we wanted to estimate is this volume transport. So what is the strength of this Antarctic bottom water flow at each of these three gateways? And so that's what I'm showing on this plot here. So here we've got volume transport as a function of time, um, where the, uh, the circles, the triangles, and the squares show the different locations. So the circles are the Ross Sea bottom water, the triangles are the Adeliland bottom water, and the squares are the exchange across that Princess Elizabeth Trough. And the points are from where we had the repeat hydrographic sections. Um, because we need the repeat hydrographic sections to be able to tell us what the thickness of the water mass was at that time. Um, and so what we can see here is the measurements that we made, which are in black, show um, quite a significant decrease in Rossi bottom water between uh, 1992 and 2011, and then an increase in that transport again by 2018. For um, these circles here, showing other measurements of Ross Sea bottom water, which also show an overall decrease in this time period. And then this is a time mean here from a model. And then these uh, triangles are showing the Adeliland bottom water, which is decreasing slightly overall, um, but not as much. And then with that exchange of the Princess Elizabeth Trough, we see a little bit of variability, but really this is hovering close to zero. So Ross Sea bottom water has the greatest mean, it has a mean of about three sphere drops. So a sphere drop is uh, 10 to 6 uh, meters cubed per second. Um, and this is our calculated error, which is including um, instrumental uncertainties, methodological uncertainties, and an aliasing from the fact that we don't have a full coverage in uh, time uh, as well as space. So we've got our Rossi bottom water, which has the greatest mean, but also shows the most significant amount of change. And by calculating our error, we were able to say that the changes that we observe were significant. And so what we did is, um, if you remember our map from before, we essentially have a box where we've got these three different water masses flowing into. So if we assume that those are the only water masses that are feeding into Antarctic bottom water, and we don't have a significant flow going out of the basin, then we can simply add those up. And that gives us an estimate of the lower limb of the overturning circulation. So this is a strength of this uh, deep overturning circulation in the Australian Antarctic Basin. And that comes up to, um, uh, is what I've labeled here as overturning, um, around four, six fair drops. Um, which is consistent with other estimates um, of this overturning circulation. And because the Ross Sea bottom water has uh, the greatest mean and the greatest variability, 
that's really driving um, the changes that we found in the overturning circulation here. And again, this shading is showing the error on that. So now that we've got this time series of the um, abyssal overturning uh, circulation, we can look at how it's changing. And so what we found is that between um, the early 1990s and the late 2010s, there was a slowdown of 0.8 sphere drop per decade. Um, so we see a slowdown in the strength of Antarctic bottom water or a decrease in the strength of Antarctic bottom water. And that's made of these two components here. So quite a sharp decline followed by a rebound. So we're getting changes in our circulation. But as Antarctic bottom water is delivering this uh, oxygen rich water to the deepest parts of the ocean, even though the concentration of the oxygen is not changing, the amount of that water reaching the basin is, uh, is changing. And that's causing uh, the oxygen concentrations to decline by six micromoles per kilogram per decade. Um, and that can explain, if you remember from the map earlier on, um, all of those changes that are seen in the deepest parts of, of the ocean, of the basin there. And it was believed before that circulation changes might be to explain, um, but here we were able to calculate and quantify that. So that was quite um, a nice finding from this study. Um, and so earlier on in the talk, we were um, we saw how as you get freshening, you get a reduction in the area of Antarctic bottom water. So those densest classes just aren't formed. And you also get a reduction in the speed of the flow of that bottom water. So we kind of suspected that these changes in the um, overturning circulation or the strength of that transport were related to uh, changes in salinity. And um, further upstream on the shelf, there's been this 63 year uh, long term freshening trend um, in the Ross Sea. And this has been attributed to uh, increased uh, glacial melt by Stan Jacobs and others. Um, and there's been a more recent rebound. So a rebound in the salinity, which is what I'm showing in the black here, ar around about 2014. Um, and that was caused, as believed to be caused by more uh, short term climate variability. And um, this work by Alessandro Silvano um, and, and others. And so we there's this independent uh, estimate of the uh, salinity on the Ross Sea shelf. And that co-varies quite nicely with our uh, estimate of transport further downstream. Now, these are slightly offset because of the averaging that I had to do when I was calculating this. But the main uh, message is that as we get freshening of these Ross Sea um, uh, shelf waters, we get a decline in the transport and then as you get a salinification of those Ross Sea shelf waters, you get a, an increase in the transport there as well. So we've seen a physical relationship between the density of Antarctic bottom water and its area and speed. Um, we've seen a co-variation of the Ross Sea shelf salinities with volume transport. Um, and independently, there are, when you have uh, models that model the overturning circulation, if the models add um, uh, an amplified freshwater or perhaps a more realistic freshwater, the strength in the reduction of that overturning circulation increases quite significantly. So these three pieces of evidence are, put, are telling us that the shelf water salinity is a key driver of transport changes around Antarctica. So to go back to our original questions, um, filling in the gaps of our understanding. So what are the physical mechanisms driving changes in Antarctic bottom water? Well, both. Um, it's never simple enough that it's one. So we see a freshening that's a property change, which causes a speed in the area of bottom water export to decrease. And that creates a slowdown in the production rate of Antarctic bottom water. So these two are not mutually exclusive. At the end of the day, the salinity or the freshwater budget on the Antarctic shelf is key. So the same physical mechanisms apply around Antarctica. So the mechanism, which is freshening leads to slowdown and vice versa, uh, is very likely to apply in other regions, um, irrespective of what is driving those changes in, in shelf water salinity. 
And there's some um, lovely work by Shenji uh, Zhu and others. And I think he presented last week um, where they found changes in salinity caused by different processes to us also caused a decline in the transport. And they were looking in the wet LC. Now, our, um, the decline that we saw, which is sort of around here in the Australian Antarctic Basin, um, is more likely associated with um, glacial melt. Um, and that's because upstream of where we're looking, there's significant uh, uh, losses in the ice mass. And so that's shown here by this red blobs and also separately here where these blue, very dark blue colors are indicating glacier derived freshening. So that fresh water is getting um, flowing around the uh, Antarctica here, entering into the Ross Sea, perhaps leading to that long-term freshening trend. And then eventually you see it further downstream, which is what we're measuring. Key question, is the trend in Antarctic bottom water natural or anthropogenic? Um, well, I think at the end of the day, who knows? This is still an open question. Um, but what we have shown is that what affects salinity can be both natural. So we've got climatic anomalies, um, which impact things like sea ice production, um, which is what Alessandro was looking into, and more anthropogenic changes. So if we think that this enhanced glacial meltwater is due to anthropogenic warming, um, then that appears also to be having an effect on Antarctic bottom water. But there's lots of scales of variability, and it's always difficult to unravel these when you have limited data. So to completely separate those, um, we need to sustain long-term observational programs, such as these repeat hydrographic transects and moorings data, collect more high-resolution uh, high regional data, and um, develop and use global models that have ice shells and realistic freshwater forcing. And also to add on to this, to come up with ways to use all of these pieces of information together um, and hopefully try and answer some of these questions uh, moving forward. <laughs>